Well, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to this Tuesday with a Scholar presentation. I am Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator for the Ramsey County Library. We've got a really good speaker today, Professor Maina Lee from the University of Minnesota. We'll be talking about uh, the Hmong and the Secret War in Vietnam with reference to the Hmong um, uh, resettlement in Minnesota, so a very interesting program. This program would not be possible without the courtesy of our co-sponsors, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota, and Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, which are the financial underwriters of the series. So for both of those, I thank them very much. And I also thank uh, Professor Lee, who comes to us from the History Department at the University of Minnesota. I first saw Professor Lee on a program that was shown on public television in conjunction with the Ken Jones Vietnam series, and when uh, her face came on the screen, uh, Ken Burns, what did I say, I'm sorry, Ken Burns, uh, when her face came on the screen and it flashed, you know, the, the what is it called, the Chiron, uh, flashed below it saying University of Minnesota, I thought, aha, I'm calling her up, and I did the next day. And so here she is, and please help me welcome Professor Maina Lee. Thank you. Thank you very much, and just so you know, I am a survivor of the Vietnam War, so nasty questioners will not intimidate me at all. Okay, you know, my, my motto is, I survived the Vietnam War, you know, okay, the, nothing compares to that, so, as a child. So, um, I am not only, you know, not only do I study it and teach it, I lived through it um, and, and crossed the Mekong, you know. So after that, okay, everything else is just, okay, a wash. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, Judy, for inviting me. Uh, thank you all for coming, even though today I was, I was a little bit afraid that we're gonna have another disaster like a couple weeks ago, right? And that this was gonna be canceled, but I'm so happy that the weather cooperated. Being a Hmong person myself, I always wonder why am I in Minnesota? And why are the Hmong in Minnesota? You know, um, what is the reason, right? And I'm sure some of you uh, are wondering that too, you know, why, why is there so many Hmong people in Minnesota, especially St. Paul, Minneapolis? Um, can I just uh, see a show of hands um, by my own curiosity? Um, is there anybody in the audience who were sponsors of Hmong families back in the 70s, 80s, or recently? Yes, okay, so one person back there, yes, so mm -hmm. so a couple of people in the audience. Uh, and I, I, because I just wanted to say to you that actually uh, we've, we've learned a lot about the Hmong nowadays, but the story that has not been told is from the sponsor's side, you know. Um, and I wish, uh, and I'm gonna dedicate perhaps the next phase of my research to actually getting those stories as well, because I, I think it's important to know, right? Uh, why you know do people decide to sponsor these strange looking Asians who they didn't even know were Hmong they thought they were Vietnamese you know a lot of sponsors right um, thought they were Vietnamese and then they get here and they're like no no actually we're not Lao we're although we're from Laos we're not Vietnamese you know although we endure the Vietnam War uh, we are Hmong and, and a lot of people are like what, what's Hmong Right, completely lost. So uh, I think that story is important, uh, which I will not talk about today, but I wanted to recognize that story too. So who are the Hmong? Well, during the last 20 years or so, um, we have begun to see monuments being erected by Hmong people across the US. This is one of them. Okay, this is a plaque, the very first one. Uh, that was erected in 1997. If you go to Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, D.C., this is where it was erected. Um, and actually, this is actually not the, the very first. In fact, uh, before that, two years before that, in 1995, there was a commemoration ceremony uh, with congressional recognition of the Hmong's role in the secret war. Uh, in, 
Colorado. So that was the very first one, although there was not yet any monument. So all the monuments occurred after that official recognition. Uh, closer to home, we have, of course, uh, probably the largest one to date is the Sheboygan, Wisconsin Secret War Memorial. Has anybody been to it or know of it? Or you know, it's it's located right on the shores of Lake Michigan uh, in, in Sheboygan. You wonder why? You know, I wonder that too. You know, I, I keep asking them why not Madison or Milwaukee? Why Sheboygan? You know, there's a long history of the engagement of the Sheboygan population. Uh, you know, with, with these kinds of activities, so they they won, they won the bid, you know, to have it over there. Um, and of course, the the monument is granite around granite structure with names carved in the inside, um, and then on the outside, as you can see, are artwork by local elementary children. You know, so having children participate in it as well. Um, and in addition to the names, there are plaques. Um, the larger plaques are reserved for the Hmong heroes. Uh, in 2006, when this was unveiled, this was the first plaque uh, dedicated to the uh, T-28 pilot, uh, whose name was Li Lu. Uh, he holds the Guinness World Record for flying the most combat flight of any fighter in history, over 5,000. His motto was, fly until you die. And literally, that's what he did. He was trained in the early 60s, and he flew uh, in support of the secret army until he died in July 1969. So of course, right, the, the very first has, has to go to him. You know, so he, he's, a, he's a hero to both the, the Hmong as well as the American ravens who flew in Laos, you know, American pilots who flew in support of the war in Laos. And uh, not to be outdone, uh, this is the Secret War Memorial that was erected in, in Fresno also in January, uh, in January 2006. This one recognizes sort of the, the Hmong, you know, American alliance. Uh, you, it depicts two Hmong men rescuing a downed American pilot, because this was, of course, one of their objectives, right? One of the American objectives for the secret war. This is uh, the monument from behind, and then uh, uh, another view from the front. And then, of course, since Vang Pao has died, General Vang Pao, the leader of the secret army, has died in 2011. And very quickly, in 2012, uh, his loyal followings have erected monuments, you know, specifically not just to honor the Hmong uh, and the sort of American alliance, but specifically to honor General Vang Pao himself. Uh, so this is the one that was, uh, you know, erected in Chico City in California in 2012. And I must say, it's not without controversy, right? As the Hmong are sort of, you know, raising all these monuments, there are those who contest the raising of these monuments. So some of these monuments have actually been vandalized, you know, by, by those who disagree uh, with the Hmong presence in their cities. And Vang, Vang Pao's statue was beheaded. Uh, it was, the original one was cast out of, of cement. So they decided, okay, we, we gotta do it in a way that it can't be easily uh, right, taken apart or vandalized, so they recast it in bronze now. And not to be outdone, the, the Hmong in the Twin Cities, I, I always wonder, you know, why are we, we have the largest population, you know, uh, the most concentrated, we, we are known for our political activism, okay, prop, perhaps the most educated group, you know. Uh, I, I, and I know the, the California Hmong are gonna hate me for this, but perhaps, okay, so hints perhaps. Uh, why do they take so long? You know, political divisions, probably. Um, you know, it's much more complex, right? So, so sort of the agreement to raise a kind of monument took a little bit longer to negotiate, but they did, um, you know, raised a monument recently, and in 2015, you know, they had the ground, op uh, ground, uh, the ribbon cutting ceremony, and then, of course, in 2016, they finally completed the monument, um, and people, uh, very important people, congressional uh, as well as state politicians and local politicians, attended that unveiling. Uh, the monument itself, as you can see here behind the group of, of people, one of them is my grandma, by the way, um, is a bamboo shoot. Uh, and you know, a close up of the bamboo shoot depicts the stories of the Hmong, the lowest level with life in Laos, as the Hmong knew, and then the middle levels is in the refugee camps, and finally you get to the top, is depicting life in America. 
Now, not to be outdone, okay, the Hmong also fought for the French during the first, first Indochina War from 1946 to 1954. They were, you know, there were some Hmong loyalists who fought, you know, for the French as well. And so uh, once the, those in France saw what the Hmong Americans were doing, right, right, you know, sort of erecting all these monuments, they followed suit uh, and they now have their own monument as well, you know. Uh, this is the one that was erected in southern France in 2014. Um, and then on top of that, there's a group of Hmong who the French not only brought to France, but they then uh, lo relocated directly from Thailand into French Guiana. This is, uh, again, the memorial in, in France. You can see the, the, the granite stone here standing here, okay? And again, extremely important members of the former Indochina commanders showed up as well, just like uh, at the Hmong commemorations. Uh, the Vietnam War commanders often would show up. Uh, and then those in Guiana, they, they decided, you know what, there's a group of Hmong, very small population, uh, about 3,000 or so, um, but they gotta have their own monument too. Right, because this is the, the French territory in South America. And so they erected two of them at two of the Hmong villages uh, in Indiana. This is the, the first one. And then a much smaller one uh, that was uh, erected in 2016. Um, again, you know, just sort of commemorating and honoring the Hmong. Uh, it, it just, just, I think the most important thing is, is to broadcast the name Hmong. Right, to broadcast the name Hmong uh, and, and to sort of invoke this debt of gratitude that the French as well as the Americans owe the Hmong people for fighting you know, as allies of the US in Indochina. So the question then, who are these you know, Hmong, right? Why, why are there monuments to them you know, uh, in, in Europe, in South America, in North America, you know, uh, across the US, why? Who are they? Very briefly, they are from indigenous to China. This is a group of people that, that claims origin in China. Uh, according to the Hmong, if you go to one of the Hmong funeral homes every weekend, uh, our elders are passing away very quickly. Every weekend, all the funeral homes are, are just full. You know, there's, there's about four or five funeral homes in St. Paul, they're all full. Um, and at the funerals, if they have not converted to Christianity or picked up one of the new ways, and they still carry out the funeral in accordance to Hmong tradition, they are, the, the deceased is instructed to return to China. Okay, you gotta go convene with the ancestors. Where are they? They're not in America, they're not in Laos, they're not in Vietnam, they're in China. So uh, according to, to this, this oral tradition, and the Hmong don't have writing systems until the 1950s, by the way, you know, until missionaries invented writing systems and Romanized alphabet for them. So, uh, you know, the, the oral history, the, the oral traditions are passed down from generation to generation uh, to specialists to male specialists, and, and they tell them, okay, this is the origin. It's supposedly, they originated from the Yellow River region of China, you know, north, where, where present day Beijing is, is. You see here Beijing in the, in the map. Um, and over the course of 5,000 years, they were slowly pushed by the Chinese, you know, the Han Chinese Empire south to the next, the Yangtze River in this region here. And then ultimately, in the 19th century, as a result of colonialism, uh, pressures of colonialism uh, and pressures from the Qing government, they were then pushed again uh, south into modern day Southeast Asia. So they began to enter Southeast Asia only uh, in large numbers since the 1850s. Although scholars have noted that they already begun to migrate into northern Vietnam as early as the Ming Dynasty or the 1400s, you know, so uh, about 600 years ago, in other words, they've already started the migration south. Today, the Hmong are spread across the globe. Those of us who study Hmong, you know, we joke and we say that the only continent that does not contain a Hmong person is Antarctica, you know, because it's it's too cold and. and you know, finally, there's a place right where, where Hmong people don't want to be. Okay, <laughs> you know, you just can't. You have to live among the penguins. You know, uh, in the the populations uh, in in China, they, they're still that's the largest population because that's essentially the homeland. Um, there's still about five million uh, Hmong speakers. You know, people who Hmong in Minnesota could understand their language. 
their traditions, their culture mutually. Okay, about five million, and that's 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 about the the population of Minnesota, right? You know, so pretty, pretty not not that big if you think of it in terms of the U.S. But if you think of what's the population of Laos today, about five million, right? So essentially, you know, we have as many Hmong in China as we do in the whole country of of present day Laos. You know, so that is significant. Uh, one million in Vietnam, and you will note that because of the migration, as you go further and further south, you know, the population, uh, of course, decreases in proportion. Uh, and then, of course, since 1975, to the west as well. So one million in Vietnam, about 300,000 in Laos, or 10% of the population, uh, about 150,000 in Thailand, and about 10,000 in Burma, okay, in the highlands of Burma. And then since 1975, the populations have spread across the globe, as I said. Uh, the 2010 census says about 260,000 Hmong in the US today, 15,000 in France, um, Australia about 3,000, very small numbers, but they, they you know exist there. Canada about 640. The, the numbers for, for the other countries outside of the US, I should say, are not very reliable. I'm thinking they're much more than that, okay? So um, keep that in mind. And then of course, French Guiana about 2,000. Argentina, you know, 250. New Zealand, you know, and then Germany. You know, that's, that's a surprising one, right? Germany, they, they have, the, the official stats have 70, but I'm thinking probably around three to 500, okay, much larger than that. And in the US, you know, just, just look at uh, Minnesota, of course, has the, contains the second largest total population, okay? Uh, California actually beat us at 91,000. Uh, but Minnesota, the St. Paul, Minneapolis, uh, the Twin Cities region especially, has the largest concentration. If you look at the top 10 metropolitan areas in the U.S., it's Minneapolis, St. Paul at 64,000, or 90, virtually 98% of the Hmong in Minnesota lives you know, in these two uh, cities and nearby suburbs. Um, and then Fresno, California at 31,000, that's the next largest. Uh, then you're going from Sacramento, Milwaukee, uh, Merced, Stockton, and then Wisconsin, uh, Wausau, Wisconsin actually ranks eighth. Um, so, you know, uh, and then Madison as well. So again, nearby in Wisconsin, there's actually a large population as well. So then the question is, who are the Hmong and why Minnesota, right? I mean, yeah, like I said, I, you know, in light of yesterday, you know, I was wondering, why am I here? I was just thinking, like, no, I need to be a snowbird, you know, like commute, have my winters in Arizona, like many Minnesotans are, are doing. Um, why are they here in Minnesota? And the short answer, of course, is that the Hmong are here as a direct consequence of the Cold War or of U.S. actions in Vietnam, U.S. interventions in Vietnam. Backing up very briefly, the, the history is, of course, uh, as I said, the, I'm not sure why, okay, here we go. Uh, the, the Hmong came into Indochina beginning in the 1850s and 60s, and this just so happens to be precisely the time when the French began to colonize Vietnam from the south. You know, so of course they are going to clash with the French. The French established the empire by 1893. They had consolidated their rule of and defined what is today Indochina, meaning the countries of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Okay, so when we use the word French Indochina, these are the three nation states that we're referring to. Um, and they, Consolidated their rule beginning in the 1860s, and they remained there until 1954. However, French rule was interrupted during the Second World War when the Japanese seized all of Indochina, okay, from the French briefly from about 1941 to 1945. And it's during that period when the Japanese were actually still there that the U.S. began to think about, right, they, they start to think about the Cold War. This is the, the moment of the Cold War, especially beginning in 1946, because what happens in 1945 during the Japanese occupation? 
actually the U.S. was working with Ho Chi Minh, you know, and the Viet Minh. And the U.S. sent the OSS to build that very first company, or, or they call it battalions, but, you know, actually is a group of 100, the very first companies. So this is before the Cold War, but immediately after the Second World War, the U.S. would start to engage in their Cold War politics as the U.S. engaged in geopolitical struggles in Europe with the USSR. So now they would do a 180 degree shift where before they had supported Ho Chi Minh in his quest for independence from the French, they would shift around 180 degrees and they would support the, U the French retaking Vietnam. You know, and, and I think this many policy uh, you know, people involved uh, in Vietnam say that this perhaps was the biggest American mistake, right? Because we ourselves, look, look at what the U.S. was doing in 1945. We did have a colony in Southeast Asia, and that was the Philippines. What do we do for the Philippines? We accorded the Philippines independence in 1946. But we contradicted ourselves by, you know, forcing the French back into Indochina by supporting colonialism in Indochina, right? So it's sort of U.S. policy, it's sort of hard to, to understand, uh, but this is our government, you know, and, and we elect them on behalf of ourselves, and these are the decisions that they make, you know, right? They get us into troubles abroad, you know, so, so this is what happens. Now, uh, when the French attempted to, to take, retake their Indochina colonies, they started what is called the First Indochina War, and this is the war between France and Ho Chi Minh's uh, Viet Minh Independence Army. That was decided finally in 1954 at a small place called Dien Bien Phu, you know, which is, is just like very close to Laos, on the border of Laos and Vietnam. And this was sort of be the harbinger of what was to come. Okay, why did they fight that battle there? It's not by coincidence. And this is important to Laos. It's because the French knew that Laos was integral to the integrity of Indochina itself. They, they needed to retain Laos in order to keep their Indochina colony. Okay, so that's why they fought that battle there. And of course the French lost. Okay. In the end, they, they were uh, defeated by, by the Viet Minh. They underestimated the Viet Minh. They thought that these are Stone Age people, very much like what we did later, the U.S. did later. Okay. These are Stone Age people, uh, and we, are, we, we can easily defeat them in one battle. You know? And of course, they were wrong, because actually the Viet Minh was very well supplied by that point by the Chinese and the USSR because China was, at that point, had been you know, taken over by the communists in 1949. So they got two countries supporting them, you know. Um, so they lost, uh, and immediately after the loss, uh, they, they then had the, the Geneva Accords, they met in Geneva, and of course, uh, the stipulation was that the French would pull out, meaning granting independence to their Indochina colonies. But in the Geneva Accords, it was stipulated that Laos and Cambodia would be neutral. Okay, that they were they were never involved in the war. In other words, okay. So uh, and not only that, but supposedly in 1956, two years later, there was supposed to be a national election to unite Vietnam. Okay, both North and South Vietnam, and that never happened. Why? Because the U.S. intervened. The U.S. had supported the war. By the end of the war, the U.S. was paying for 80 percent of the French war. You know, so of course, once the French lost, this, this was during the height of the Cold War where the U.S. was thinking, wow, you know, communism, okay, this, this evil tyranny is actually going to take over the world. We need to stop it. And where should we stop it? Where should we keep the domino from falling? We have to keep it, you know, we have to keep South Vietnam, create a South Vietnam, right? Um, and of course, Laos was supposed to be neutral according to the accords, right? So how does the U.S. carry out the war in Laos? It has to be secret. Okay, so it involves the CIA going in there to create an army. And this army was largely staffed by Hmong, okay, 60% Hmong, 40% other ethnic groups, including Lao and other minority groups. And the commander of the secret army was General Vang Pao. 
know, this is how the CIA would deal with Laos, keep Laos from falling, you know, because Laos was also a crucial domino, okay, but because of the accords, the U.S. can't send in troops. We sent in troops to South Vietnam, of course, right? but not for Laos, okay, it's supposed to be neutral. So the Second Indochina War uh, began with the U.S. intervention uh, in 1955 to 1975, and I should say, okay, it's both North Vietnam and the U.S. intervening in Laos, because the North Vietnamese actually did send troops, okay, to battle the Hmong secret army. You know, so they actually intervened. Laos situation was very complicated, of course. You know, after independence, they would have different nationalist factions struggling to decide what the future of Laos would be. And to put it very simply, in Laos, it was a divided Laos where neutralism was impossible. You know, because each side had the mentality, right? You're either with us or you're against us. There, there is no neutralism. So represented here, very simply, the, the politics in Laos was, of course, uh, th these three individuals, okay? These sort of represent the three factions that emerge in Laos. And you can see in the center here, you know, is Suvana Puma, who was prime minister throughout much of the secret war period. He claims himself to be a neutralist, okay? The guy who tries to, to wrangle in the left and the right, the communists and the pro-US, pro-West, you know, and keep Laos from exploding, you know, or keep the country intact. And then I think they, they purposely staged this, you know, to represent, so he, he's, he's in the center. Um, to his, right, to, to his left, then, of course, we have the Red Prince, okay, the Red Prince because he saw that Laos' future was intricately tied to communism. There, there has to be massive social changes in addition to independence, you know, it can't remain the way it was. And then of course, to his right, to Suvana's right, was represented by Prince Bun Um Natsen you know, another royal prince from the Southern Kingdom who had been reduced when the French created Laos uh, there were multiple kingdoms on the Mekong, and the French made him inspector general, you know, and they reduced his kingdom as a province, so creating Laos in the process. But he's pro as a result, because, because he emerged under French tutelage, of course, naturally, he was pro-French, and when the French left, he was pro-Americans. And so this is the, the politics during the, the war, the Second Indochina War, this is the kind of politics that went on in Laos. For the Hmong also, they, because the, of the lowland um, factionalism, it easily also split the Hmong in the highlands. Now the Hmong are highlanders, they live in the highlands. The Lao are lowlanders, they, they are wet rice cultivators who live along the Mekong Valley. Um, the Hmong are dry rice cultivators, you know, who grow their rice and live in the cool redoubts of the highlands. Because they come from China, they actually have not acclimated to the tropical jungles. You know, and in fact, they don't have uh, immunity for uh, malaria-borne, you know, mosquito-borne diseases like malaria and dengue fever and things like that. So they remain in the heights. Um, so when the lowland factions split, of course, it's, it's very easy also for the Hmong to split. And so during the time of the French, we have two Hmong leaders. We have Tubi, Tubi Li Fong, uh, go back up here. We have uh, Tubi Li Fong, you know, the one in uniform, uh, who was uh, French educated, very Francophile, you know, fluent in French in the French colonial school systems, and he sided with the French, you know, because they, they legitimate him as, as a Hmong leader. And then we have Fai Dang Lomliyao from the Lo clan uh, in the suit who sided with the communist, you know, uh, and so he aligns himself with. Prince of Panuvong, you know, as an ally, whereas Dubi Lefant aligned himself with, with the French and with Bun Um and, and those on the right. And so between 19, uh, since the French left between 1955 and 1960, what happens is that these three factions were in constant wrangling, you know, in, it was stagnant, the, the, the National Assembly was stagnant, it may kind of remind us of our Congress right now, okay. So, so they, you know, there's discussions, but it didn't get to go anywhere, because those on the right would vote only for their agendas, those on the left would vote for theirs, and then the neutralists are kind of split, some going this way, some going, so basically the National Assembly was stagnant. And finally, American, the American was also intervening in the various elections to make sure that the communists do not take over, you know, uh, and do not become 
majority in the National Assembly. Finally, the Prime Minister Suvana got so tired, he's like, I I've had enough. He quits. He goes into exile in Cambodia. What happens? The critical moment, okay? One captain of an elite paratrooper, the only elite paratrooper company trained, you know, during the time of the French, decided that he's sick of, of international intervention. He wants the USSR in Vietnam to butt out. He wants the US to butt out. So he does a coup d'etat in Laos, in Vientiane, in August 1960. And he did it with just his one company because they were so well trained and they, you know, very disciplined. And he chases the general in command of the Lao army, Pumi Nosavan, who is pro-West, south. And he takes over Vientiane. And his demand was for Suvana, the neutralist prime minister, to be reinstated. And for, again, the US, North Vietnam, and the USSR to stop intervening in Lao affairs. It is at this critical juncture that Bill Lair, who was a CIA operative training Thai border patrol policemen in Thailand, again, to, to retain the integrity of, of Thailand as a nation state, decided to take matters into his own hands. He flew to the south to meet with General Pumino Savan. And then after that, he went in search of General Vang Pao. Okay. Why General Vang Pao in the Hmong, right? It, this is a map of Indochina, and you can see, again, you know, just as the French had anticipated during the French period that Laos was the critical domino, that Laos had to be retained. So in, in the summations of Bel Air, he believes that Laos was the critical domino, okay? Not just South Vietnam, but if Laos fell, communism was going to triumph in Indochina. And so if you look at it, why the Hmong, right? The Hmong live here on the Plain of Jars in northeastern Laos, you know, right on the border of Laos and Vietnam. And if you look at the roads, you know, the only way, the only access into Laos, here's the capital of Vientiane, and then here's the royal capital of Long Prabang. The only way to access Laos, okay, the only land route traditionally, the traditional invasion route into Laos was through the Plain of Jars. You, whoever captures the Plain of Jars, according to General Vang Pao, would be king of Laos. Because once you capture the Plain of Jars, you can easily storm Vientiane. Okay? Then you, that, that's next. And Luang Prabang, where the king sits. So this was such a critical strategic area populated by the Hmong. Okay, the Hmong population in the area was 30%, and in some of the important major towns, as much as 50% of the population. So they were very strategic for that region. Not only that, right, but the Hmong had already served under the, the French. During the time of the French, the French had actually built a Hmong army commanded, as I said earlier, by Tubili Fong, you know, about 9,000 individuals. You know, so they had uh, experience fighting the communists. Vang Pao himself emerged out of that army you know, uh, under the time of the French. And of course, perhaps, you know, maybe, maybe a third reason is that the Hmong had a reputation for being fierce and warlike, okay? They actually have been at war for three, four centuries before coming into Southeast Asia. And this is true. So Hmong men have, have experiences, they, they know weaponry. They, they, in fact, the Hmong, you know, could manufacture their own flintlock rifles. And virtually every Hmong man who grew up in this time period um, for, for their own protection, you know, were, were trained on how to use, you know, the flintlock uh, rifle. Okay, so this is why it was very easy for the French to, to recruit them, you know, for army induction because they already knew, okay, they already knew how to use weapons. And in fact, they might be unique. You know, they might be the, the only Highland group that's unique in that because of their three centuries of, of war in China, you know, and then the need to constantly protect themselves as they migrate into pioneering jungles, you know. There's a lot of, of, of uh, you move into jungle areas, you, you need that kind of protection, you know, that kind of weapon. So perhaps that's why, uh, the, the third reason. 
And uh, the American objective was, of course, right, for the whole secret war was, of course, uh, to, to keep the communist bottle on the plane of jars so that they could not storm Vientiane or Lom Prabang, you know, the royal capital or the administrative capital on the Mekong. So that was one of their objectives. The second objective was, was for their war in Vietnam. Uh, what the U.S. did was they actually established several radars uh, at a mountain called Pati, which is located just about 20 miles from the Vietnamese border. Uh, and then later on, uh, several years later, one at Nak Han, uh, you know, also, uh, you know, in the purpose of the radar was for, to guide American, you know, uh, fighters who bombed North Vietnam. Okay, once they installed these radars, then pilots could bomb North Vietnam, whether it was rainy or shiny or cloudy, you know, very accurately, okay. Before this, these radars were installed, in fact, pilots, as they bombed North Vietnam, could not bomb during the raining seasons because they were, again, for political reasons, very, very um, careful not to bomb, supposedly, civilian installations, right? So only military, you know, installations. But now that they have these two radars, they can actually bomb very strategically and very accurately. And the purpose of the Hmong army, of course, was to maintain these radars, okay, to guide, to guard these radars. Uh, and then the third purpose for the U.S., of course, was as the, the, the uh, U.S. pilots flew from Thailand as well as the South Vietnam Sea, if they got shot down, they were told to actually veer off into Laos. And why? Because the Hmong army was there ready to rescue them. Okay, so if they ever get shot, you know, their instruction was veered into Laos. Okay, and the Hmong army will come for you. Now, of course, the Hmong have their own objective as well. Okay, um, and their objective, of course, first and foremost, was was to save their homeland. Right, war had occurred. Uh, they they see the North Vietnamese as invaders. There is an army of North Vietnamese in Laos, and so they wanted to save their homeland, uh, their families. You know. Uh, and then the second objective, of course, if you, if you talk to General Wang Pao and to Billy Fong as to why they fought for you know, the king and the Americans was because right, the, the need or the hope for political economy, possibly political autonomy. Okay, political autonomy where the region of Sing Kuang could sort of be a autonomous Hmong zone, you know, where they would live by their own cultural uh, and their own laws. Uh, and so that, that's the other hope. And of course, uh, the third reason is simply it goes along with the first one, which is to save their homeland. Uh, and that is that the CIA actually provided weapons, you know, trainings, uh, and then legitimation for Wang Pao as a contending Hmong leader on the side of the right, of course, right? So uh, there is personal incentive for Wang Pao uh, to be on the American side as well. Now, in 1960, backing up a little bit, in 1960, during the Gong Lei coup, uh, actually, Wang Pao says, you know, uh, he didn't know what to do. He hesitated, right? Because now there's war in the lowlands between, you know, the right, the left, and the neutralist. And there's a neutralist, uh, you know, captain who has now seized the capital. He didn't know what to do. So he's sitting in the highlands, in the hills, and he said, we, meaning the Hmong, only want to conserve the right to be by ourselves, to live with our shamans on our mountains under the cloud, far from the valley where we would catch all sorts of melodies. Again, referring to mosquito-borne diseases, right? It's like, we don't care about the lowland. We just want to live by ourselves, okay? Just give us peace, but we can't do that, right? We can't do that. Uh, and then he says, the order came from King Sisavavang, so meaning that he, he operates under the king. He says, um, King Sisava actually sent him a secret order immediately after the Gong Lei coup that orders him to rally the province of Sing Kuang, which you know he was the military commander of the province at that time. Okay, to rally the province under Prince Bun Um and General Pumi No Savan, the two rightist forces, uh, and this is what he did. He, he says, "I consider myself Laotian. I had to obey him." Okay, meaning the king, right? 
there's also now uh, in, in since exile um, the, the other reasons as well, right? So first was to protect their their own interests, but there's also now many Hmong uh, in America who are coming up with with uh, testimonies about the U.S. promise. Okay, uh, and, and the U.S. promise, of course, was that. Uh, the French, the Hmong, the French had, had had recruited the Hmong and then abandoned them, right? And so the Hmong were very concerned, of course, according to these testimonies. And they said, "What? What? How do we know you're not going to do what the French did to us, right?" Uh, and so supposedly um, there was those promises. Uh, the CIA promised guns, rice, uh, and money for Wang Pao's army in exchange for recruits. Um, and one CIA actually, uh, one CIA operative actually said, "You know, the Hmong cast their lot with us. We said that we would take care of." them, you know, and then Jerry Daniels, perhaps the most loyal CIA operative and, and the one who every Hmong person tells me who has worked with him loves the Hmong, you know, the most, unfortunately he died in 1982, so, you know, his legacy ends. Um, but Jerry Daniels in a letter to the Hmong at their, in 1975, at their first New Year celebration at Ban Vinai as refugees in Thailand, this is the letter, uh, he, he admits that he made promises to the Hmong, okay? He says, I still remember that I, and perhaps other Americans who are representatives of the United States government, have promised you, the Hmong people, that if you fight for us, if we win, things will be fine. But if we lose, we will take care of you. Okay, so this is Jerry Daniels' letter, in fact. And I think he was, uh, you know, we can, we can debate about that, you know, later on, okay, in the discussion. Um, but, but, you know, I, I think it was a very powerful letter. But, you know, the, the, note the, the ambiguity, right? We will take care of you. What does that mean, you know? And the ambiguity also means that it could mean nothing, right? Because it's like, it's not stipulated how we're going to take care of you. But on the other hand, it could be very, and it has been very powerfully translated by the Hmong, okay? Very concretely. Taking care of us means right this 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 including these monuments okay so so it's been used to argue that so so again on the one hand it could could mean nothing on the other hand you know because of the ambiguity it could be interpreted by the Hmong to mean virtually anything okay uh, including today some veterans group are trying to fight for veterans benefits for Hmong uh, men who have fought in the secret war it's because of these sort of statements ambiguous statements that they can do that um, but of course, there's inducements and there's threats. Uh, other clan leaders say Wang Pao, you know, uh, uh, forced or threatened them. You know, he said that he sent us guns. If we don't accept the guns, he would call us communists, you know, and they come attack us. Uh, and, and, you know, the communists did the same thing, okay? It's not just only Wang Pao, of course. As I said, neutralism was impossible, so the communists would also send Hmong villagers uh, weapons, you know, and then if they didn't choose to be on the communist side, they would also get attacked, because there, there was no neutralism. You can't just say, okay, hey, I, I'm a neutralist. I don't want to fight for the Americans. I don't want to fight for you guys. Just leave me alone, you know, I just want to farm my rice paddy, rice fields, you know, okay, and live happily. No, that, that wasn't able, well, it wasn't possible. Uh, and you know, the, re the biggest reward, of course, was that, that the U.S. pressured Suvana Puma, the prime minister, to promote Wang Pao as a major general and a commander of a military region, too, in, in 1964. Uh, it, but what that meant also was that Wang Pao now henceforth would be the person who would carry out the war, right? Meaning that he would have to embroil the Hmong, meaning that the Hmong, Hmong men were going to die in massive numbers, okay? And that's what happened. So the secret war, okay, ultimately, you know, what led Hmong people to Minnesota is, uh, simply put, it, it's a war be between 1961 uh, and lasted until the signing of the Paris Peace Accords in 1973. Uh, is essentially this is a, a, a enlarged, you know, version of the Plain of Jars, you know, as you saw earlier. The war, if you imagine a diagonal line uh, from from, you know, this top down to the bottom. Okay. The war is just just sort of, they call it the seesaw war. During the, the sort of almost over 10 years, almost 15 years, the, the Wang Pao's army and the communists, all they did was capture the plain of jars back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Okay. Uh, and what, what is the, the purpose of the war? Well, to control the plain of jars. right? Uh, and so during the monsoon season, Wang Pao's army are guerrilla, light infantry, Okay, quick on their feet. Um, and during the raining season, they would go on the offensive. 
because it's in the rainy season that the North Vietnamese army, which is conventional, they use conventional tactics, they're equipped with army tanks, heavy artilleries, they're bogged down in mud, okay? And when that happens, from April to about November, October, the end of October, Vang Pao would go on the offensive, and he would push them all the way across the plain jars to the other side. Uh, and, and his capital is, is here, okay, in, in south of the plain of jars, you know. So he would push them all the way across, capture the plain of jars, and then in the dry season when the, the uh, communists can move their tanks and their heavy artilleries, they will come and push Vang Pao off the plain of jars right to the south, you know. Uh, of the mountains uh, of that region. So for that duration, almost 15 years, this is what the war was about, okay? Um, and, and those of you if, you, if you look at the, uh, or if you do the readings on, on the Vietnam War in, in South Vietnam, right? A lot of the generals who came out of South Vietnam, one of their critical remarks against you know, politicians in Washington, D.C. was that they were prevented from winning the war by being forced to fight the war in the South rather than to move on the offensive against North Vietnam, right? So this is General Westmoreland, uh, that, that's his take of it. Vang Pao says the same thing to me, okay? He says, the betrayal of the Americans, which he never knew until he was already in exile. The betrayal w happened during the war because they would never let him win. What he wanted to do was to push the North Vietnamese all the way to Vietnam. But the CIA never allowed him to do that. Because as soon as he pushed them off the plane of jars, they say, Vang Pao, stop. We just want you to fight a defensive tactic. We don't, we don't want you to you know, like push them all the way, okay? Just, just stop there, right? And he said, all they have to do was cut off my supplies, right? Because he was completely vulnerable. You know, he was supplied by the CA. So, so all they had to do was stop sending me the, the bullets, the weapons, and helicopters to lift my men when they get injured. And that's it. I'm a sitting duck. Okay. So he says the betrayal was not the abandonment in 75. It actually happened during the war itself. So, so he has a sort of very, very uh, similar take to General Westmoreland and those who fought in South Vietnam. You know, that, that the U.S. actually never intended to win, okay, because they wanted a defensive war. Uh, and, and then, of course, the war went on, but, you know, by 1968, uh, as part of the Tet Offensive in South Vietnam, this is when, when during the New Year's, when the... Uh, you know, every single U.S. installation in South Vietnam was attacked in, in surprise. It was a surprise attack, you know, and captured by, by the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. Uh, very similar things happened in Laos. Very quickly uh, after the Tet Offensive, the North Vietnamese began to uh, strategize taking, you know, uh, positions in Laos and to end the war. And so we can look at what happens to Vang Pao on, on the plain of jars, uh, especially in military region too. First, in March 1968, just, just you know, three months, okay, after Tet in South Vietnam, uh, Pati, where they have one of the radars that was very close to the Vietnamese border, was captured. And then um, that, that radar was, was built in 1967, so it, very quickly that was captured. Not only that, but the next, by the next month, the province of Sam Nhe, uh, which is part of military region two, military region two is two provinces, it's Seng Kuang, the Plain of Jars, and Sam Nhe, the northern province north of that, uh, was captured by the Patet Lao in, in the Vietnamese forces. And then uh, immediately after Samnia, uh, of course, going along with Samnia was the second position was, was Nakhan, you know, which, where they had the second uh, radar installation that was also captured. Not only that, but the North Vietnamese, in order to capture these, these strategic positions, increased their forces from 51,000 to 110,000. Okay, how big was Vang Pao's army? 30,000. 30,000. So you're talking about 20,000 regular forces, 10,000 SGUs. Okay, these are the SGUs, the ones trained by the CIA that, that are the forward offensives, right? Um, and, and you can look at what, what Vang Pao is, is fighting for, you know. It's basically, right, you, you can you look at the numbers and you know that, uh, you know, Essentially, it's not a winning situation. Uh, and naturally, the Hmong population suffered massive casualties uh, between 1961 uh, and right up until 1975. Uh, you know, casualties to over 25% of the male population, okay? You know, so we're talking massive losses. If you have an army and you lose 25% you know, of your army, that, that's huge. 
that, that's too much of, of a cost, right? Uh, and so by 1967, uh, even very early on, even before the Tet Offensive, okay, in 1968, um, Hmong men had, had died off, you know, so much that boys as young as 12 had been, you know, were re becoming recruits uh, into Vang Pao's army. And of course, uh, the Hmong population was devastated also by massive infant mortality as a result of war. Uh, one statistic says that in 1971, for example, as many as 71% of the infants born you know, uh, in St. Juan died, okay? And so infant mortality death of 71%, especially as a result of the measles and polio outbreak that occurred uh, in that year. Well, suddenly, right, something that Vang Pao didn't anticipate, even though Vang Pao was finding these, these sort of massive odds, you know, against the North Vietnamese army, he actually didn't anticipate that the U.S. would lose. This is how much faith he had, you know, in the U.S., very much like the U.S. also never anticipated that they would lose in Vietnam as well, right, because we just bombed them back to the Stone Age, you know, um, and they did. You know, and Vang Pao never anticipated that. Uh, finally, uh, the two sides, you know, North Vietnam and the U.S. had their secret meetings. They, they actually started to meet in 1969, which Vang Pao never knew. You know, he didn't know that there were secret negotiations between Le Doc To, who represented North Vietnam, and Henry Kissinger, who represented the U.S. But they were, and they finally they reached an agreement in 1973. And all of a sudden, it just all stops. You know, the war just all stops, right? So um, Vang Pao was ordered at that point to to uh, release his 10,000 SGUs, his forward offensive, in other words, and integrate the regular uh, soldiers back into the Lao National Army. You know, so uh, they essentially are, are, this is a concession of loss, essentially, for Wang Pao. And for several years, of course, the, the uh, communists remained uh, pretty quiet, you know, from 73 to 75, as they wait for the Americans to pull completely out of South Vietnam. Finally, in April 1975, the, the communists went in the offensive, okay, and they captured Saigon and renamed it Ho Chi Minh City. These several pictures of some of these evacuations. This one is, is the evacuation in Vietnam, okay, of, of South Vietnamese. Same thing in, in uh, Laos in May 1975, for fear of his life, the CIA told Wang Pao, you gotta leave, okay? And you can only take your top officers, you know, people with the ranks of colonel, you know, and above, right? And so in the end, you know, they, they airlifted uh, 2,500 people uh, into Thailand. The, the war was, was gone. Vang Pao, however, still thinking that this is temporary, that he's you know, gonna be called back into Laos, uh, sets up camp uh, in, in Thailand. Uh, and eventually, however, that, that became permanent. By June, the, the uh, communists had pressured the Thais to kick Vang Pao out of the country. So Vang Pao was already on his way to Missoula, Montana. The rest of the Hmong, the 150,000 Hmong, were left, you know, in the camps, uh, and we can roughly, you know, categorize them into about four waves of people who came. Uh, the first wave uh, following Vang Pao, pretty steady from 19, you see in the graph here, 1975 to 78, and then suddenly it jumped. Why? Because in 1978, after Vang Pao had completely pulled out of Laos, this is when the communists went on the offensive on the plain of Jars to attack the resistance that remained there, you know. So that resulted in one in influx of Hmong, uh, and that number then steadily rise up into 1984 there. Uh, and then the third wave is once the communists seize control of, of most of the Plain of Jars, uh, the numbers continue to come, uh, but that leads to then the, the next massive wave from 1984 to 1992. And then, of course, right, the last wave coming to the U.S. was the last group who came in 2004, 2005. Um, and that has a, a history, which I'll talk about in a little bit here. What happens is that in, in 1989, this is the end of the Cold War, right? This is when the iron, iron walls fell in Europe, and this is the end of, of the sort of U.S., USSR, uh, you know, the sort of Cold War period. The U.S. began to change their policy uh, toward Vietnam, and then very similarly, the Thais also began to change their policy toward Vietnam and Laos, which had become communist by this point. Uh, and as part of, of Thai efforts to reach out to their neighbor, uh, the Lao communists, in 1992, they agreed to close down Ban Vinai, 
Okay, because Malvinae had become sort of a resistance recruiting area for Vang Pao in his homeland politics, you know, to retake Laos. So they, they agreed to close it. And they were, the Hmong were then giving choices, okay, uh, three choices, either to repatriate back to Laos, to live in Thailand, okay, to accept, you know, Thai asylum, live in Thailand, or to go to the U.S. and other third countries, you know. And um, the Hmong didn't want to do any of that. So they didn't want to do any of that. So, so what happened? They, they developed a fourth option. What they did was someone would just quit and they left Ban Vinay. They went into this, this, the, the grounds of this, this uh, monastery called Wat Tankerbok in, in northeastern Thailand. And they remained there until 2004, 2005, which is why we had the last wave. Okay? Um, of course, it, when they came, the Hmong came in, into Thailand in 1975. The U.S. developed criteria for U.S. resettlement, okay, and we can look at some of these criteria, and then we can look at, you know, what, what, how, you know, under which criteria do the Hmong claim? In fact, in 1975, when the Hmong came out of Laos in large, massive numbers, the U.S. was extremely concerned, right, because the war was completely secret, you know, so most Americans didn't even know what was going on in Laos. That the CIA had dabbled and intervened, you know, so they were they were clueless uh, and. While the Hmong were, were you know, good enough to fight for American right, agendas in Laos, in 1975, the U.S. decided that they were actually too primitive to be accepted for asylum in the U.S. Okay. So, so um, this is, this is the, the argument that they made. You know, in fact, some of, some of the uh, policymakers was like, well, they're, they're fresh off the trees, okay? according to historian Paul Helmer. You know, he, he, he interviewed some of these individuals. Uh, the view was that they're, they're fresh off the trees, you know? so we can't take them. It, it would be so hard uh, to, you know, to, to assimilate them into American society. Okay? And if you wonder why Jerry Daniels wrote that letter, right? this is why because he realizes that he needed to put something in writing, right? You know, to make sure that the U.S. carried out its obligations to the Hmong. So after much protest by Jerry Daniels and other, you know, Americans who had worked with the Hmong, uh, this is the resettlement criteria they set up and, and then they finally opened immigration to the Hmong in 1976. Before that, the only Hmong who were allowed was Vang Pao and his family, and then those who had worked directly with USED or with an American company, they could come, okay? But the Hmong as a whole was not allowed to come. So they, they were, were uh, P1 through P6. Most of the Hmong claimed P3 or P4, which is that they had a close relative or family in, in the US. And uh, P4B, they, they served, okay? They served in the armed forces you know, for General Vang Pao. Once the, the U.S. decided that they would accept the Hmong, uh, the second thing that they did was that they uh, had relocation strategies, right? Because of their Stone Age narrative that they were too primitive uh, for U.S. asylum. What, what, what then is the strategy? What, what we, the U.S. is going to disperse them, okay? Disperse them, one family, you know, into each little city across the U.S. And this is uh, done according to the logic to distribute the economic cost of, of integrating the Hmong into American society, but secondly, also to accelerate assimilation. Right? You know, you can assimilate if you if you resettle them by nuclear families across the U.S. You can assimilate them much more quickly. You know, quickly, uh, and and the Hmong just would not have this. Okay, because Hmong society is organized by clans. They, they don't, nuclear family doesn't exist in Hmong society, okay? By extended families and clans, each clan have their own ritual experts and specialists that they need to carry out the life rituals of birth, death, marriage, okay? They, they don't exist uh, unless, as a society, unless they have a clan. So the Hmong took matters into their own hands once they were in America, and hence, within a few years, guess what? We have Hmong enclaves like the Twin Cities, like Fresno, and of course, Wausau, Wisconsin. Right? These are the, some of the top enclaves. Now, in Minnesota itself, um, those who arrived as refugees in 1976, there's been a few who came because they worked for USAID before that, but the first immigrants, uh, the first refugees really arrived in 1976. They were sponsored by churches you know, in the beginning. And uh, it so happened that some of the first arrivals, of course, were among the most educated coming out of the secret war of Laos as well. And so these individuals began to 
consolidate social services and, and job training programs and you know they, they uh, organized uh, a Lao family community as a nonprofit organization by 1980 uh, and that began to draw then you know the, the rest of the Hmong who wanted job trainings language trainings you know uh, having having job and language training Lao family community was in charge of that you know training people uh, to enter the job market and, and to speak English and things like that. Um, and this results in the massive population we have now in Minnesota, which is uh, close to 70,000, 97% of it are in the Minneapolis-St. Paul Bloomington area. Uh, in St. Paul, the Hmong is the largest Asian group, okay? They are 78% of the Asian population, and they are outnumbered only by African Americans. Okay, so the second largest minority group. Now, why Minnesota, right? I think, I think it's, I always argue that it's because of the, the, the sort of liberal progressive okay, mentality, the Minnesota nice is one of the thing. But if you look at some of the latest, like the, just a couple of days ago, I saw in the news, uh, the 2018 US News and World Report ranked Minnesota as the second, okay, most prosper, prosperous states, right? Iowa actually beat us, uh, okay, <laughs> which is kind of shocking, but you know, so, so you know, they have very good educational systems, good economic su success uh, in Minnesota, and a lot of them found jobs when they came here. Um, coming out to the end here, but I, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit more about, let's look at some of the stats of, of the educational attainments. Uh, the Hmong by and large, compared to mainstream society, are, are still you know, very you know, uh, behind, compared to what they were back in the 80s and 90s, especially in terms of education, they have made more progress than any Indo-Chinese refugee group, okay? Uh, that is compared to where they were when they came, okay? Uh, and the Vietnamese were, was the most educated groups coming out. You know, the Hmong were the least educated coming out, had the least amount of education uh, per population coming out. So, uh, it, you know, it's, it, we, I think if you look at the society as a whole compared to what it was, there's a lot of progress. But Again, compared to mainstream, then we know that they are behind. 50%, 53% still report, according to the 2000 census, uh, of having no schooling, okay? Uh, and then 24% uh, report having a high school degree, 13% having uh, associate degree or bachelor's degree, 3% graduate, okay? Graduate professional, like J, you're having JDs, MDs, PhDs, okay? Uh, so graduate degrees, uh, and, and you know, that, Compared to, to sort of the, the mainstream, um, I think in American society, about one quarter of us have right, BAs, and then about 10% of us have postgraduate degrees. So, you know, just so that you know uh, what the stats are for that. The early jobs, uh, when the Hmong first came, of course, right, the, the only jobs that they could do was farming. And so, uh, University of Minnesota Agriculture Extension Services you know, had farming projects where they trained Hmong farmers. In America, it's very different than in Laos. Okay, in Laos, you can just follow the jungle and then you grow your crops. In America, you got to know pesticides and weedicides and you know all those usage. So they had to train the Hmong. And many of these these projects, although it ended in 1985. Uh, is the result of the farmers markets that some of you participate in today, okay? So it does have long-term implications. Most Hmong, according to the 2010 census, are in manufacturing, some in professional and service uh, work. Uh, and although the, the numbers fell after the market crash in 2009, the number of home ownership actually has gone up to 50%. So very high home ownership, this is what they value, right? Um, and they also are very successful enough that in 96, they actually established their own chamber of commerce, you know, with under 50 uh, membership. Perhaps I think one of the most distinctive achievements uh, of the Hmong in Minnesota, having been here after 40 years, of course, I think are the political achievements. You know, they are so active and they actually lead nationally, okay, in terms of political office. And the, the surprising thing, the other surprising aspect, of course, is that women, are the first elected officials, okay? These are the first two. You know, this is Jo Lee. She was the first one elected to the St. Paul School Board in 1991. And then Mimua, right? Everybody knows Mimua, right? You gotta know me. You know, um, she, she was the first, uh, not only the first Hmong, the first Southeast Asian refugee, 
okay, to so so the actually beat the Vietnamese, you know, with the most educated group. Not not by too far because Mi Mi Mu actually won in that uh, February two thousand two special election, and then that November she ran already as incumbent in the state. Um, but that November, uh, they, they also have two Vietnamese representatives in California. So you know, not 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 too far ahead. But you know, Mi Mu actually did uh, put put herself as the first Southeast Asian refugee. Uh, and then, of course, among women, I'm, I'm just shocked at the among women uh, how how they they. They are just like you know making uh, pioneering strides. Recently, some of you may have read, right? This is Sophia Wu Lo, uh, who was just appointed by Governor Dayton in January as Hennepin District Judge, and she is the first in Minnesota. Okay, the first Hmong, uh, and and a woman, you know. Uh, and then those of you who who probably are not into politicians, I, I think may have heard of my name Mua, you know, in the Bright Prize. She published the very first anthology back in the 90s, Bamboo Among the Oaks, you know. In, in the Hmong, one of the incredible achievement for a non-literate society, people who don't have literacy, is that they are the fastest to publish, okay, literary works of any Asian group. Okay, like, like, like the Chinese were here in the 1870s, they actually didn't publish until the beginning of the 20th century, you know. Uh, the Hmong, just, just within 20 years, they were publishing, okay, and they were having their books out. And then the, even more important, right, Gao Galia and her late homecomer, uh, the very first uh, memoir was also um, published uh, recently. This is the, the sort of textbook, I think, that virtually every professor at the University of Minnesota assigns. So I, I don't assign this because I, I, told, I told my students, I know you read it somewhere, okay. Uh, and then uh, in, in terms of, of, I think there's actually, you know, still a lot of economic struggles, but um, since 2000, there's actually been more migrations out, okay, migrations out of the Twin Cities, you know, for, for our purposes and looking at Minnesota here, uh, and, and also out of California. And one of the popular uh, destinations is, is uh, they call it the tri-state, the Oklahoma, Missouri, and you know, Arkansas states where, where a lot of families have moved down uh, to buy chicken farms, okay, and to, to farm. Uh, and, and, you know, if you look at that, it's, it's it, you know, it's okay, so what's so impressive about that, right? I, I think when I look at that, you know, how much money do you need to buy a chicken farm? You need down payments of 200,000 plus, okay? You gotta have that, okay? Right, because these chicken farms are in, in the millions of dollars, you have your 20%, you know? So I'm just amazed at the number of, of, of people who can save that amount given their very low paid jobs. You know, they have to be super frugal, right, to save that kind of amount. Uh, and then the Wall Street Journal reports that in 2003, um, there's actually uh, 700 to 1,000 families who have already gone to the tri-states. And in 2003 alone, there was 100 family in Arkansas alone, you know, we're, we're doing these chicken farms. So 100 chicken farm, you know, owned by Hmong entrepreneurs in just that one single year, right? So they are moving out. Um, but of course, there are challenges today, okay? Challenges today for the Hmong, economic challenges. The Hmong population has a lot of health issues, uh, you know, they, they, mental health issues as a result of war and dislocation. Uh, they are impoverished about, you know, 25% of the Hmong population still is Below poverty level, okay, it's 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 improved dramatically from 60 percent in the 90s, but you know still 25 percent of our uh, live below poverty levels. Uh, they still have issues, uh, uh, high, high le rates of high school dropout, college dropout, you know, and so achievement, despite my statistics, right, uh, of the you know now about 14, 15% who have college degrees, you know, achieving educational attainment is still very hard for younger generations of Hmong. And I think it will be even harder with Trump's educational cuts, you know, so it will be even harder for them. Um, I'm out of time, actually going a little bit beyond, a couple of minutes beyond, so I want to leave plenty of time for questions and discussions and, you know, uh, maybe other reflections and, and uh, opinions from the audience. And, and I will bring yeah. the microphone yes. around so that everyone can hear the questions. I think this, well, I think you kind of referred to it, but I, I think I remember when, I, I've been around long enough, I was here, uh, that when the Hmong came, there was not a written language? And is that true, and is there now, or how did you overcome that? How did the Hmong people overcome that? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, writing is always has always been important to the Hmong, despite the fact that they don't have or, or they don't have one that we know of. They they claim that they have one, okay, but but it's passed through secret societies only. So you know you have to be initiated right uh, into the secret society. So we don't know, okay, it's never been verified. But we do know that there was a Hmong man in 1959 who invented a, a unique system, which uh, William Smalley, who was a linguist, uh, and and his co-authors in the book Mother Writing uh, distinguish as one of the uh, five, like, like a fifth global system, right? All writings are pretty much derived from four systems, you know, he says, uh, either Chinese or Romanize or Arabic or Sanskrit, right? You know, w- one of the four. And he actually distinguishes this as a fifth system, right? That it's so unique that it's, it's a system by itself. Um, but that system, again, is taught to, to those who follow the society, right? Uh, and so not popularized. Um, and then at the same time, in the 1950s, uh, missionaries invented the what we call the Romanized phonetic alphabet, which is phonetic base. Uh, and that has been in use, although mostly among the converted, like the, you know, used to translate the Bible uh, and then taught uh, among those who have been converted to Christianity, uh, and then popularized a little bit during the refugee period, V9, you know, when monks started to spread around the globe and they needed to communicate with each other, so they learned to just to write back to families. Um, and today, that is, I would say, the most popular system. Uh, although, it, by saying this, there's going to be people who who are going to write to me, okay, and and say, no, it's not, okay, <laughs> you know, so. so um, uh, some of the Hmong nationalists will, will complain. But that is the most popular system. Uh, and again, the, the way I see it is that it's most of them, however, has been used only in the churches. Uh, that's, that's where I see most of them used. Uh, they, it is taught at the University of Minnesota, this Romanized alphabet, also at St. Catherine's University, um, and then at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and then several other universities in California. So I'm thinking in the long term, that will be the system that will be most popular, uh, because the, the PAHO, or the, the written system invented by the Messiah back in the 50s, it's very hard to use, you know, you've you got to invent the software for it, right? But the Romanized, you can just get on the computer and start typing, you know, and so um, that's why it's become very popular. So uh, communications between Hmong Americans and those in China and Thailand and elsewhere has been using the Romanized, and I think eventually the Romanized version will be the one that will take over. Mm-hmm. Is there any role that the clan tradition plays now in modern Hmong life. Yes, uh, you know the the those of us who are Hmong, we say the clan hovers over us, okay, like like the Grim Reaper, okay. So so <laughs> it does, it does, uh, it, it does, and there, um, you know, it, there's still people who are traditionalists. They still do things the traditional way, um, and of course. The most contested topic, the most controversial topic in the community, as you will note by my name was book, is the bright price, right? And, and the, the contestation is between those who are traditionalists who want to retain the bright price, and then those who are fighting. Like my name herself fought against it. her whole book is about her fight, you know, uh, against her mother not collecting her bright price, you know. So that remains very controversial. There is an 18 clan group that writes by laws, mostly again to guard, you know, the bright prices and, and to guard marriage rituals and things like that. Um, so it is still in practice. On the other hand, having said that, there are individuals like my name who are fighting, you know, right? These these sort of traditional values, traditional patriarchal values, especially, which they feel that are. T- tying women down, right, are keeping, most of them are, are really about women, you know, right? You know, any kind of cultural system that's invented, I think it's, it's geared toward women, you know, controlling women's behavior and women's worth and things like that. And so there are fights, you know, against that. Um, funeral rituals, for example, right, is very expensive and it's, it's very elaborate in Hmong society. And although as much as I would love to have a Hmong funeral, you know, I, I can see the argument against it. I mean, funeral, funeral expenses run f- f- 
60, 70,000, 100,000 dollars, okay? Because, because it's done to honor the, the dead, the deceased, and, and you, you, you do it in accordance to their achievements in life, right? So, you know, elders uh, have very expensive funeral system. There, there's been protests against that, it, it talks against that, you know? Uh, so this is one of the areas that, that people, you know, some of the reformers want to reform, right? The bright price, the funeral practices, you know, simplify it, um, make it much more manageable, you know, because really, Hmong funerals used to last as long as 13 days. Okay, and, and now they're like, oh, well, okay, let's do four, right? The traditional still do four. They do Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then burial on Monday. But they're like, that's too much because you have to feed all the guests. And by the time you add up everything, it runs fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, you know? And so we got we to gotta change that. So there, there's, yeah, it's, it's dynamics, a shifting culture, shifting society. This is the moment in history where, where I think those who are more intellectuals have to uh, get on one side or the other and help make a decision, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so we're in the Hmong area in Vietnam, a beautiful area, and seems to be fairly independent from the communist government and doing fairly well economically. I wonder about the Hmong in Laos what their relationship is to the government and uh, the condition economically. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if you look at the Hmong, right, I think, I think uh, the history of the Hmong as viewed from the U.S. side and especially as viewed in America is that the Hmong unilaterally supported the United States, you know, but that's not even true, okay? So in Laos itself, about two-thirds of the population was on Rang Pao side, but one-third of it was on the side of the communists. In Vietnam, okay, almost the one million population supported Ho Chi Minh, you know, and they were actually instrumental to that battle at Dien Bien Phu because they were the coolies who carried the artilleries up to the mountains and then bombarded the French. Although they don't get credit for that, by the way, you know, the, the, the government is very cautious about giving credit. Uh, uh, and so, uh, you know, in Laos, uh, in, in Vietnam, I know that there, there has been um, efforts, you know, there has been efforts to control the Hmong, especially uh, the, the sort of stereotype of the Hmong is cutting down the forest, right, to control their Sweden practices, uh, you know, where they, they fall down the jungle and then grow their rice. So there's, there has been efforts to do that. So a little bit of constraints. Um, and also in Vietnam, uh, the government has now begun to encourage Vietnamese to actually migrate into the highlands. You know, in fact, over a million Vietnamese have, have gone up into the highlands to seize land that you know, traditionally had belonged to the Hmong. You know, so this has happened. In Laos, uh, the group that fought on the side of the communists uh, actually have very high-ranking positions. Okay? They, they are very well rewarded. Um, the president of the Lao National Assembly, you know, sort of like our equivalent of Congress, Today is a Hmong woman, you know, she, she is a Hmong woman, the daughter of, of the revolutionary nationalist hero Tao Tu, you know, uh, from the Yang clan. So, you know, uh, and then they have Hmong in the central committees, they have, you know, uh, the, the Hmong themselves on that side brag that they have much more, they have made much more progress under the communists than they did, than those on our side under the king. Okay, so, so for example, one, um, you know, Tong Zhe Ta, who is the vice president for national reconstruction, told me in 2008 when I sat down with him and interviewed him that the Hmong consists only of 10% of the population, but they occupy 16% of the political positions in Laos. So in other words, much larger, right, than their own population in total. So they, so they, they throw you stats like that, right? On the other hand, my observation is that um, there's still a lot of prejudice uh, and discrimination against the Hmong. And now that the revolution is still fresh in people's minds, you know, sure, the, the children of the revolutionary Hmong leaders get political and educational advantages. But the question is for how long, right? You know, as the revolution fades, you know, and as Laos becomes communism in name only in capitalist, you know, in practice, you know, what's going to happen to the Hmong in Laos? Um, for sure, there is not as much opportunity for education as here, you know, so Hmong Americans are kind of like, nah, 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 right, you know, right? Yeah, we may have lost that war, but we won the peace, okay? So sort of like what the U.S. says in Vietnam too, you know, because um, look at us, you know, like you can't have this kind of educational opportunity 
uh, in Laos, it's much harder, you know. So, uh, but I think in terms of politics, they, they do brag that they do very well, right? We have a question. Yes. Could you comment on the uh, secret bombing in Laos and the uh, efforts over the years to clean up the unexploded bombs? Yeah, officially, there's not supposed to be any bombing in Laos. Okay, all the bombing that occurred in Laos, uh, most of it was because of what happens is that U.S. pilots would fly from Viet from Thailand over Laos, and they're supposed to drop their bomb in Hanoi or wherever they do. Most of them actually don't. So what do they do on the way back? Then they release all their bombs in Laos. And if you ever get a chance to go to Laos, okay, look out the the especially the Plain of Jars area. Look out the window as you're approaching the plane of jars. And you got to do it very quick because the plane ride is very quick. It's like 20 minutes, like literally, whoo, and then you're like, oh, I'm going down already. Okay, you got to look out. So you got to pay attention. But, you know, what you will see is you still see today when I was there in 2008, um, I was just amazed by these beautiful ponds all in a line, right? You know, like, because they retain water now. And I was like, wow, how do they do this? Oh my God, those are bombs, you know, right? As the bombs are dropped, you know, you still see the evidence. Uh, the latest, when Obama was there, um, right before he, we, you know, came out of office, um, he did make promise. Uh, I think he promised $5 million or something, which is nothing, okay, to clean up, you know, uh, these, these um, unexploded ordinances. Um, but as far as I know, especially right along the borders, you know, there, there has not been major cleanups, and people are still getting killed, animals are still getting maimed, you know, right? Because the, these sort of little bombs, they're, they're ingeniously designed. They're, they're designed where they're, they're supposed to twist, and then they're calculated that just just right before they hit the ground, they explode right at ground level to, to you know, cause massive casualties on anybody nearby, right? Yeah. And some of them actually, they, they don't, they don't explode because they didn't twist enough, okay? So just imagine, twist, 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 doom, right? And then 20, 40 years later, some little kid comes, they're, they're very pretty, okay? They're actually very pretty. Comes along, wow, cute little thing here, twisted just right, okay, boom, right? So these things are still happening in Laos. Uh, so I know that Obama has promised you know, like the five million. I'm not sure if Trump is obliged to keep the promise though, because it was promised right at the end, you know, when Obama was, was in Laos. So I'm not sure, you know. Same thing for Cambodia, right? So, so same thing for Cambodia as well. Yes, yes, please. Hello. Yes. <laughs> My name is Norma. Um, I'm interested in fashion, and uh, do the uh, how do you say it? M how do you say it? Mang. Mm-hmm. Mang. Mang. Mm -hmm. Mang. Yep. Uh, do they wear costumes? Yes, and, and I think I've shown you some some of it up here, right? You know the beautiful, elaborate costumes. Uh, and there have been new fashion designers in the community who have incorporated the, the sort of tribal, you know, or ethnic into their fashions, you know, into their formal wares. And there's actually a fashion show almost every year, you know, I've in the community. I've seen their stitching at yes. uh, the yes. Science Museum. Mm -hmm. Very beautiful. Yes. So they do. And, 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 and their embroidery uh, is still being incorporated, not only by the Hmong themselves, but also at the international level, like the international fashion industries will incorporate, you know, Hmong Laos. embroideries. You're from Laos? Yes. Uh, are there street gangs in Laos? Street names? Gangs. Gangs? Oh. <laughs> street gangs in Laos was the question. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, I, I think for, for me, when I was in Laos, to be honest, I actually felt safer than in Thailand. You know, and the reason is because Laos is communist, so, so criminals are very afraid of the government, you know. It's, 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 it's an irony, but because they, they are very tough, there is no law, okay? So they can arrest you anytime, anywhere, put you in jail, they don't have to tell your family, let you. And so I, my, my experience is that there is actually less crimes in Laos that I, I see 
um, than in Thailand. You know, like I, I'm more afraid in Bangkok of, of pickpocket people, you know, than I am in Laos. And I think it's because of the fear of, of communism. How long that will last, I don't know. Okay. Here's a question over here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, um, as uh, Hmong people begin to assimilate into Minnesota culture, and you have uh, intermarriage with native Minnesotans, what kind of challenges does that present to the clan structure and the historic Hmong families? Um, Great question, right? So as I talked about, definitely the major debate among the clans and among the community today, the challenge is the bride price, right? And among the community, the argument is that the Hmong actually are being unfair to their own because if their daughter marry another Hmong, then they will require a traditional wedding, a bride price, you know, right? But if they marry a white guy or some other non Hmong guy, fine, okay, we'll forgive you. You don't have to do all those traditional stuff, you know, right? And this is why, this is the challenge, you know, is that's why the clans are talking, right? And they're saying, no, we gotta standardize, we gotta have a standard. We don't have protocols for when, when, you, and you, when you marry outside of the society, and this is sort of unfair, you know, practices, right? So they make it very simple, either they just say, okay, fine, just, just do your civil wedding, you know, with the judge, right? And then, or they say, well, you know, since the groom is not a monk person, just write me a check, right? With, without all the protocols uh, of coming to kowtow and paying respect to the ancestors. You know, monk weddings are very complicated, right? So without all those com complications. So this is the current debate in the community. Uh, and again, my name Mua talks about a little bit about that, right, in, in her book. Uh, and it does represent challenges, you know, even though the Hmong are open to sort of in, inter-ethnic and interracial marriages, it does challenge their, their system, you know, because now what do you do? Your daughter's married to a non-Hmong. You can't require them to have two marriage negotiators know how to deal with you, how to pay the bride price. Maybe, okay, simplify it, you know. So uh, this is why a lot of people are arguing that we need to do away, right? We need to do away with the bride price, and we need to simplify the rituals and make it standardized so that even non Hmong can participate easily in it. We have just a couple more minutes, uh, and I know there's several people who have questions, so I'll just ask you to ask your question as quickly as possible. Okay, just a little groundwork, then a question. Um, to say that communism won't allow God and the state is that, and, and they persecute people that believe in anything. And then just something from the Ken Burns film where it showed um, the leader of Vietnam and then he's brother to the archbishop and then um, Kennedy makes a comment and then he's killed a couple days after. And um, just to say what's the demographics of Hmong and how did religion play in facts there? Is Vietnam? Yeah, the Hmong are located mostly in the north toward the Chinese border, although uh, since 1975, because of land pressures, the, the Vietnamese government have moved some Hmong into the central areas of South Vietnam. And then some of them, they don't want to be under communism, so what do they do? They migrate now to Cambodia, okay, to the Cambodian side. So there is that phenomenon happening. But most of them are, the, the main population, most of them are in the highlands in the north, and there is persecution of Christians. There's, there's been a mass conversion beginning in 98 to 2000, and in fact, one third of the Hmong population in Vietnam are now Christians, you know, even without a clergy. They're converted through radio waves, you know, in the, uh, okay, from California <laughs> and from the Philippines. This is one of the most, you know, like interesting mass conversions. There's a book uh, called The New Way. You know, the title is called The New Way uh, by a Vietnamese woman who studied that phenomena. So there is uh, attempts by the government now to to persecute and to tone down, you know, the uh, the, the conversion process. And Hmong Americans are, of course, very quickly to defend, right, to defend their, their brothers in Vietnam and to expose. And so the, the government has toned down the persecution a little bit, but they're still trying to, yes. I think we it. have time mm -hmm. for just one more question. I'll yeah, in 1954, it was agreed there would be a election in 56. Problem was, Ho Chi Minh was expected to get 80% of the vote. 
So the U.S. called it off. So what does that say about, uh, you know, we, our concerns with Russia now compared to calling off an election? <laughs> Yes, uh, it's very interesting, right, what's happening in, in our world today. Um, you know, scholars who have looked at U.S. power, U.S. imperial power, are, are saying these are signs of U.S. decline, okay, the decline in U.S. influence and power. The fact that we were the country that used to go and dabble and intervene with our CIA, you know, and change governments in other countries, now the Russians are doing it to us. Okay, right? So uh, it, it, scholars, American scholars, uh, are looking at this as a sort of U.S. imperial decline, economic and political decline, and you know, making interesting arguments about that. Yeah, exactly, you know, right. I, I think right. we've come to the end of our formal program, our formal time, but uh, Professor Lee has uh, agreed to stay on if, if people have a few extra questions and want to come up to the podium. Otherwise, we want to thank you very much, Professor Lee. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs>